in today, on today at this first lecture. I can't think of anything better to do than to come to some understanding about the word Buddhism or Buddha Sasana. So we'll try and clarify this this topic for for today. This suffix ism is one that changes and transforms and bounces all over the place. There's communism, socialism, materialism, Buddhism, and all kinds of things. There's the world is full of all kinds of of isms and all of them have their different meanings and they differ then from the ism of Buddhism. <coughs> so we should try and understand what ism this Buddhism is. Most of these isms or all of these isms, isms in the world differ from the ism of Buddhism. In all these other isms they are some kind of man-made theory, some kind of idea or theory or opinion or structure created by man. This is completely different than the ism of Buddhism, which is not dependent on man in any way. <clears throat> Buddhism is something natural, exists in nature, is there to be discovered, but it is not, it is not man-made. In this way, Buddhism is unique when we compare it with all the other isms. And, and this Buddhism is something which it's not dependent on any authority as well. Buddhism is, is free and independent. It's just a part of nature, a truth of nature, which is there to be discovered for anyone who cares to look. You should think of the words fact, truth, and law, and then think in terms of the natural facts or truths that exist naturally, the truth of nature that exists naturally in line with the law of nature. This is something that was merely that was discovered by a human being and then revealed how to how to understand and how to use this truths of nature was then revealed so that other people can use them in the living of their lives this is this is all that Buddha, buddhism is originally buddhism wasn't called Buddhism, or it wasn't called Buddha Sasana, especially in the meaning of this word Sasana, which is now the same thing as in English religion. In the old days, it wasn't called Buddhism or the Buddha's religion or anything like that. The Buddha originally called it the Brahmacharya. The Brahmacharya is the way of life which is sublime is excellent, which can solve all human problems, a way of living that eliminates all problems. This is what the Buddha called it. He didn't talk about the sasana as Asians do now, or especially the word religion. If we think in Buddhism in terms of the word religion, it can get quite sloppy and complicated. So we ask instead to keep things simple and clear, to just think of the words fact, truth, law of nature, facts of nature, truths of nature, and then how to live, how to understanding these, these laws and facts of nature, or the mm -hmm. law of nature, how to live, use that law so that we can live without any problems. This is the only important issue. Buddhism doesn't depend on any authority whatsoever. So you don't have to go and register yourself as a Buddhist. Anyone can come and look into, experiment with, practice and benefit from Buddhism. 
It's not necessary to be a Buddhist to do so. One can continue belonging to or following whatever religion one has followed previously or no religion. It doesn't really matter to us. Buddhism doesn't depend on, on any of that. It's just a matter of finding out what the law of nature is and then living what we call the brahmajariya, the supreme or the sublime way of life, a life that leads beyond all problems, that is free of, of problems. This can be done by anyone who <clears throat> is willing to come, take the time to learn what the, the laws of nature are, and then investigate for ourselves, in, experiment for ourselves how to use these laws or how to live according to these, this law of nature. That's all that Buddhism is about. It's available to anyone. It's not limited in any way. Another way to understand what we're talking about is to take the word Buddha. Buddha. The word Buddha means to wake up, to wake up from sleep. It's the opposite of the word saya, saya, which means to be asleep, to be sleeping. Buddha, Buddha means to, to wake up, to have awakened, to no longer be asleep. And to be awake means to not go along in a sleeping, confused way, but to see things as they really are, to see the truth, the genuine truth of things. This is what Buddha, or and then Buddhism is about trying, trying to live in a way that is awake, trying to, to stop going along in a sleepy, fuddled, befuddled way. This is the meaning of Buddha. After there is awakening, then there is knowing, waking up and then knowing everything according to truth. And then following this knowing, there is a blooming or blossoming, blooming into perfectly free, clear, cool life. And so the full meaning of Buddha is this awakening, knowing, and, and blossoming. And there's no need to, to let any little minor petty issues get in get in our way for example questions like is there God or not like on this issue some people some people go to the extreme position of saying that in Buddhism there is there is no God this is because they don't understand that Buddhism just has a completely different kind of God than most people are talking about before the Buddha, there was belief in a God that was a kind of spirit that sensed and knew things just like a human being did. But in Buddhism, they don't, doesn't follow or believe in such a God as that, but a God which is impersonal, a non-personal God. And so it's, it's not really correct to say that Buddhism is atheistic but that's a rather narrow, narrow-minded point of view. And so questions like this, though, are in the end not so important. We shouldn't let them become obstacles. They just are a matter of language, often. And so not to let them get in our way of understanding or of thinking that we're, we're unable to understand this or practice this or it's, it doesn't fit my personality or background. We shouldn't let these kind of minor questions hinder us. If we wish, we, we can go to the word religion here, but we should not understand it in a superficial way. The roots of this word mean that religion means a system of living or practice which ties mankind or ties humanity to the highest thing. Not necessarily God, as many people would have it. So we're very careful here. 
to use the word highest thing. A Christian might say the way of practice that lead, ties humanity to God. But it's not necessary to insist on this point of God. We can use the word highest thing. It's, it's broader, it's more natural. So, or in, so in Buddhism, we just, we could say if we wish that this highest thing, it doesn't have to be a God. Or we can say it's a completely different kind of God, a non-personal God. Or it's easiest to say that this highest thing is that condition, that state, which is completely free of problems. This is what religion is about, the system of living which unites humanity with the highest thing. If other religions would like to say that the supreme thing is God, then they are completely welcome to. But in Buddhism, the supreme thing is called Nibbana, or in Sanskrit, Nirvana, in Thai, Nipan. Nibbana is the state that is the, the ending or the end of all misery, all suffering, or in the Pali language, all dukkha. This is what Nibbana or Nirvana is. This is the supreme thing in Buddhism, the supreme truth which the human being can realize. If some of you still have an affection for the word God, well, that, that's, that's okay. In fact, in Thai, we have a word which has essentially the same meaning. If you shorten the word God just a little bit, we have the Thai word goat, goat, God, goat. Goat means, means law. In this case, the law of all nature, which is basically the same thing as God. So if you like the word God, you can use it in this way. Though the word goat or the law of nature is that which, which creates or builds up the world. And it's, this law of nature is what sustains, preserves the world. And it's also this law of nature which can destroy the world. All these, these attributes belong to the law of nature. And these are just the same attributes that are always given to God. And so it's really the same thing. And so please drop any ideas you might have that we, we can't come together on these things. We can't we can't have the same kind of understanding. If anyone has any, any apprehensions or concerns regarding this point of God or not God or whatever, it's, you can see by now that it's, it's really not a significant issue. It need not be any problem whatsoever. All religions can, can come together whether they believe in a god or a goat or whatever, and work together in the same way to discover that, that condition or state which is beyond all suffering, misery, and pain. And so we can let go of any things that might have been troubling us in this way in order to, to get to the, the basic issue. We have the right to, to choose for ourselves. We have this, this freedom as human beings. And so one is able to take all the different religions and practices and things that are available and examine them for, our, for oneself. And then if one has, if it makes sense, then one can try it out. And anything that is actually able to free us from suffering, from misery, from dukkha, well then we can hold to that, we can accept that in this way because we have this right and, and freedom. Buddhism is an evolutionist approach. 
Buddhism holds that the world evolved through various causes and conditions. There are others who who believe that the world was created by God. This is called the creationist view. But what really matters is finding out how how dukkha arises. And so we can study the law of nature and find out how suffering, misery occurs and then learn how to live in a way that we are free of that. Buddhism takes an evolutionist approach to this, but the bottom line is what what is the end of suffering? If we hold an evo- if we follow an evolutionist approach, then we take the law of that evolution as God. And then there's no real problem between with this word God at all. In this evolutionist approach, <clears throat> we take the the law, the law of nature as God. In we have with the word nature, we have four basic categories within nature that we can study and investigate in order to understand what nature is. The first category of or meaning is nature itself. The second is the law of nature, which we are talking about. The third is the the duty according to that law of nature, the, the way of living that is required by the law of nature. And the fourth is then the results of living in that way, living according to the law of nature, doing that duty. These are the four aspects or categories within nature. Nature itself, the law of nature, the natural duty in line with that law, and then the natural results that come from doing that duty correctly. These are the four meanings that we need to study, to investigate, to train in, in order to fully understand nature. This this word duty, the third meaning we just mentioned, this word duty is the same as the word dhamma from the Pali language or dharma, dharma from the Sanskrit language. Dhamma and dharma just mean this very simple word duty, duty toward the law of nature, the duty that follows from the law of nature which must be carried out, which which must be performed regarding the law of nature. This is the meaning of the word dhamma or dharma, which is what Buddhism is about. This sublime way of life is the exact same thing as this this duty in line and regarding and toward the law of nature. If you practice in line with the law of nature, according to the law of nature, until you are able to to end, to quench all suffering, all pain, then then that is Buddhism itself. That's the essence of Buddhism. Another word we should understand is the word the word faith, which in corresponds to the word in Buddhism, sat, sata, sata. Faith comes in, in two kinds. Sada, as we call it in Buddhism, is the kind of faith which comes after wisdom, which is a product, a result of, of wisdom, of correct understanding. There's another kind of faith, much different, which comes before understanding, a kind of blind faith. It may be necessary that there are these two kinds of faith, the faith that comes before wisdom and the faith that comes after wisdom. The first kind might be necessary for those who are unable to understand, 
such as young children. But for those who are mature enough, intelligent enough to be able to understand what's happening, then there's no need for the first kind of faith. And we only need the faith that comes from wisdom, which in Buddhism we call sada. So please don't let this <clears throat> this word faith cause any any problems for you. Don't get hung up on it. You might also want to think of the word confidence. Confidence implies a certainty, and a certainty which can only come from from wisdom, from intuitive knowledge and understanding. This is what we mean by sada. That kind of faith that comes just when somebody tells you something and you believe it blindly without consideration, just believing what we are told without any examining of it. This is a different kind of, of faith. But the kind of faith that we're interested in is the kind which is a certainty, a certainty that can only come from direct intuitive knowing and understanding which is what we call we call wisdom please be able to distinguish between these two kinds of faith and then you won't have any problems on this subject there are three factors or qualities which are necessary in any religious practice any religious endeavor the first one is sata this faith or confidence we've been discussing. The second is viriya or viriya, which means energy. To put energy into whatever it is we, we believe in. To back up that belief with, with effort, with, with energy, with trying. This is the second one. And then the third one is wisdom, which oversees and regulates it all so that things go along correctly. This correct understanding and knowledge is the wisdom thing. All three of these together are required in any religion, whatever the religion. One can't do without any of them. But the situation we have in the world now is that different religions will emphasize one or the other one of these three will be predominant or will be the leading the leading principle some may emphasize faith in be belief others effort energy but in buddhism we emphasize wisdom knowing and understanding things correctly as they really exist naturally so all three of these three are needed in in any situation, faith or sata, faith, confidence, viriya, energy, and panya, wisdom, correct, correct understanding. Now, sometimes, some some will will raise up faith as the most important principle, and then there arises the problem: Well, where does energy come from, and is there enough enough wisdom to govern it? Sometimes if there's too, too much faith, there might not be enough energy. And so sometimes we hear that all you need to do is believe. It's not necessary to, to try or to put any effort into it. And then this, whether this works or not, we don't know. But some people offer this as the way to eliminate suffering. In other situations, we, we hear of energy being given the most attention to, to gather the mind's energy, to use the mind's energy in very deep states of concentration. These are said to be ways of eliminating suffering, of quenching suffering. And in certain situations, Buddhism will use, use this approach as well. And then there's the third approach, which is to use correct understanding, to use wisdom as the, the way to destroy suffering, to free, free us of misery. 
But it's better if we speak in terms of just one person, in terms of one individual. There are certain situations, certain cases, where one needs to use sata, faith. There are other situations or, or cases which are appropriate for energy. And then, of course, there are the situations that wherein wisdom is most appropriate or is the appropriate thing. It depends on the, the case, the situation. So you must, you must know yourself, understand yourself, and then know in what situations faith is called for, what situations energy is needed, and in which situations wisdom is proper. Then we will have these three tools which can get rid of, can eliminate suffering. In India, they've always accepted all three of these, these factors and the three approaches based on them. They've always understood that these three things are, are needed. So in India, there's never been any problem about get, gathering them together, and there hasn't been an issue of, of argument and hatred be, be between the different religions that base their, their, their approaches on these different factors. It's easy, quite easy, in fact, to understand that in certain circumstances or situations, faith is appropriate. Other circumstances, energy is what's called for, and sometimes it's wisdom that's, that's needed. If we, we see this, that the backgrounds, the, the development of certain cultures or of certain individuals will require different factors at different times. If we understand this, then we have no reason to begrudge people what they need. We have no need to say that our way is right and the other ways are wrong, or this way is good and that way is bad, which ones are, are best, and things like this. This is completely unnecessary. We can accept all three of these and all three types of religion, the faith dominated, the energy dominated, and the wisdom-led kind of religion. There's no need for any argument on, on any of these, and so we shouldn't have any problems about this one. So please remember that in just one, one person, in a single individual, there have to be all three of these, these factors. And then depending on what's happening right now, what's what's called for what what is needed every individual in in their life must use comp faith must use energy and must use wisdom it's impossible to live without one of them or without two of them and so we can just accept that depending on the background of that person and the circumstances Sometimes it's faith that's needed, sometimes energy, and sometimes wisdom. It all depends on the problem that is, has occurred right now, the situation that is confronting the person right at this moment. And then that person uses faith, energy, or wisdom, as is required. If we understand in this way, then we, have no, we lose any inclination to argue with anyone about about these kind of things. And then now, after having looked at some of these points, we'd like to focus specifically on, on Buddhism, that mm. approach which takes wisdom as the the dominant the predominant factor. So when we just mention the word Buddha Sasana or Buddhism its name itself tells you what kind of religion it is. It's obviously a religion of, of, a, of wisdom, of awakening based in, in knowledge. It doesn't raise up faith as the main issue. Buddhism is led by wisdom, although there must be sufficient faith and energy to go, to go along with that. 
in this this religion of wisdom there is there is the buddha the buddha is the one with wisdom the wise the wise one who discovers what is called the dhamma dhamma or dharma is the system of wisdom which is used to eliminate all suffering all problems and then there is sangha sangha which is any one who willingly practices according to that system of wisdom any one who's who applies those that wisdom in order to solve all problems and all suffering so when we when we, in buddhism we have this the one with wisdom the system of wisdom and then the practice of that wisdom that system of wisdom with faith or sattva there's necessary that there's always a second person if one has faith one always has to have faith in someone else and so this faith implies or is necess- requires dependence on someone else we have to rely on another but when it comes to energy you can't rely on anyone else energy we have to do ourselves energy is our own our own responsibility and then in coming to wisdom even more it's a matter of depending on oneself as far as wisdom goes knowledge no one can know for us we have to know for ourselves we can't rely on anyone so with faith one relies on others but with energy and wisdom one can only rely on oneself there's a synonym for these words to rely on oneself to depend on oneself we can also say to rely on dhamma to rely on to depend on the dhamma which arises from one's own energy it's the dhamma that one knows through one's by oneself through one's own effort in this sense this is nothing other than duty the duty that we must we must do ourselves so we can say we rely on dhamma or rely on this duty to live according to to natural law and in this way we we can escape from the fact that we must rely on ourselves so then we we have the we should ask where does the problem come from especially where do the problems of happiness and suffering come from or happiness and pain where do they come from in buddhism we hold that happiness and suffering do not come from a personal god some god does not create happiness and suffering for us also happiness and suffering are not dependent on actions in past lives they're not dependent on any past actions instead in buddhism we hold that happiness in suffering comes from whether we we practice correctly or incorrectly according to the law of itapajayata itapajayata which is a fairly detailed matter which we'll discuss discuss later but the important point to know now is that happiness and suffering come from how we practice regarding this this god of itapajayata or this law of itapajayata which is once again our duty now this matter of the law of itapajayata is something that we must understand with our own wisdom so then we should examine in our own lives whether this problem of suffering 
does it exist all the time? Or does suffering occur occasionally from time to time? Or does suffering happen just when there is incorrect action according to the law of Itapajayata? Suffering doesn't occur all the time. It's not some constant phenomena. Suffering occurs occasionally. And so there are some times when our duty is to protect the state of being free of suffering, to prevent suffering. And then there are other times when our duty is to, to get free of suffering when it has arisen, which we can do with our own wisdom through understanding the law of nature. Another important principle to understand is that of cause and effect. This is very important in Buddhism. Everything that happens has its cause and goes along or exists through causes and then all causes have their effects. So Buddhism doesn't hold that suffering occurs because of some some personal God out there or some some action in some past past life sometime. Buddhism says that whenever there is suffering there is an immediate cause right here and this cause is our our stupidity our own lack of wisdom regarding the law of Itapajayata. If this is the cause of all suffering then what we need to do is to have proper wisdom regarding this law of Itapajayata and in that way there is no problem with suffering. Now a, another important principle which has to do with the principle of cause in effect is that in a religion like Buddhism we don't, if things have their cause then we, we deal with the cause. We don't just deal with the effects. If there's a problem instead of dealing with that effect, that problem, it's much better to to deal with the cause. In Thai there is a there's an a phrase which is a bit crude but will help to illustrate this point. The phrase goes something like don't use a short stick to scrape shit. What this means is if there's some manure or dung somewhere, you've got to clean it up. If you take a short stick to do it, you're likely to make a mess and get covered with the stuff yourself. So use a long stick. What this means is if there's a problem, don't just go poking around with a little stick messing around with the effect. Find out what the causes are. Deal with the causes this is much more likely to work better. If we only deal with effects, we never get anywhere. We're just doing crisis management or something. The thing is to, to find out the causes. This is a very important principle of Buddhism. Find out what the cause is, solve the cause. Like if there's a fire. You can never put out the fire if you don't find out what's causing it. If you just try and put out the fire, you might never succeed. So find out the cause, remove the cause, and then you get the effect that you're looking for. So this is an important consequence of the, the facts about causes and effects. People say that if you take a long stick and poke and annoy and hassle a dog with it, the dog will bite onto the end of the stick. But if you take a, a long stick and go fooling around with the lion, the lion will come and bite 
the one who's holding the stick. So which, which are we going to be in life? Are we going to be dogs or lions? When problems come, are we just going to bite at the end of the stick or are we going to go to the, the source of the problem, to the cause of the problem? One of these is, the, is a rather stupid approach, and one is the approach of wisdom. The approach of the lion is the one that is the approach of the Buddha, or one who has awakened, one who is using wisdom, using wisdom to go to the source of the problem, eliminate that, that source, and then there's no problem. This is, this is the the method that we learn to use by taking up the practice of, of the Buddha. When Buddhism is a religion of, of cause and effect, when we understand that everything happens, comes out of causes and then occurs, exists, proceeds, functions according to causes, then we'll understand that Buddhism is essentially a scientific approach or it uses the same basic principle as science. If something is really scientific, it uses the approach of searching out the cause in order to solve the problem. However, if we, we take a merely philosophical approach, the approach of logic and inductive reasoning and all this, we establish a hypothesis and then play around to see if the hypothesis is right or wrong. But in Buddhism, we take the more direct scientific method of searching, searching out the cause. And then once we find that cause, we can solve the problem. Now in practice we first must begin by learning and then from learning acting upon what we have learned, testing it out, putting it into practice. That's the second step and then the third step is receiving the results according to the actions. So there are three steps, learning, then acting upon that learning and then finding out what the results are. Now all three of these stages occur on a foundation of, of reasoning. <clears throat> so in learning, what is the cause? What is the reason for learning? What, what are we looking for? And then in what is the cause? What are the reasons for our actions? What kind of effects ought to occur? And then the different effects that happen, none of them happen without any reason any effect has its causes. So this understanding of cause and effect, reasoning about these things in terms of cause and effect is fundamental in Buddhism. We must learn, we must act, we must try these things out and then we must very carefully see what happens and examine the effects. All of this needs to be seen in terms of cause and effect. It's in this, this point is a heart, is the heart of Buddhism. Another fundamental, fundamental principle that must be mentioned is that of freedom or independence. In Buddhism, there is no pressure or no forcing to believe anything. Buddhism does not have any dogmatic system and does not accept any dogmas. This is completely out of keeping with, with the spirit of Buddhism. <coughs> any, any requirement to believe something or any pressure to accept this or that is completely at odds with the approach of Buddhism. If there is any pressure to believe or if there's any dogma, then that is not, that is not Buddhism. It's essential that we use our fundamental right of freedom and independence, 
that whatever we learn, we do so independently, freely, and then act independently. We should not act or study out of, out of force, out of pressure, but to do all this freely, and then the results of the actions. All of this occurs freely. This is something which the Buddha himself made very clear in a talk he gave called the Galama Sutta. It's a discourse he gave to people in the village of Galama or Kalama in India, where he points out the importance of free thought and free understanding. Studying, acting, and receiving the benefits of the action must be completely free. Otherwise, it's not, it's not Buddhism. This is a further point to be understood. So, what's, what religion is there that has the courage to say even don't believe something just because it has been said by the sasada? Sasada means the, the teacher, but not just ordinary teachers, the, the one, the first teacher, or the sometimes called the prophet. What, what religion is willing to say you don't even have to, don't believe it just because it was said by the, by the prophet? Instead, don't before you go and believe something, first listen carefully and then think it through. What has been said? Does it make sense that this would end suffering? Is that a reasonable, does that make sense? Is that reasonable? If it sounds realistic, then try it out, experiment it, investigate. And then if one actually sees for oneself, through one's own direct experience, that it actually works, that it does end suffering, then one believes. What religions what religion is there that is willing to say this? You don't have to believe what anyone else tells you, not even the, the so-called prophet, but investigate it and know for yourself in this way. So in this Galama Sutta, what the Buddha said was, don't go and believe anything just because they've been teaching this down through the years. It was taught long ago and then passed down until this time. Or don't go and believe something just, just because they've been, it's an old tradition that people have been practicing for a long time. Or don't go and believe something just because everybody's talking about it, because it's in the news or it's a, a big rumor. Don't go believing something just because it's written down in scriptures or books. We don't have to, don't go believing something just because it fits with logic or it's been arrived at through logical thought. Don't believe something just because it's been discovered through philosophical or metaphysical speculation. Don't go believing something just, just because it, it fits with common sense. Or don't don't even believe something just because it agrees with one's own opinions. It's what one thought all along. Even that isn't grounds for believing something. One shouldn't believe something just because the speaker has a degree or credentials or a nice voice or dresses in a fancy way or something like that. And even don't believe something just because the speaker is one's, one's teacher or guru or whatever. The, Buddhist, the Buddha said that none of these are sufficient reasons for belief, that one can only believe something when one has investigated it personally and found through direct experience. So one can't believe any of these external things. One can only believe what one has directly experienced in one's own life. This is what the Buddha recommended in the Galama Sutta as a fundamental tenet or a fundamental fundamental practice 
or article of practice in Buddhism. You don't have to believe this, but this is what the Buddha recommended. Even with, with children, we should use this principle. With children, we shouldn't pick up a, a stick and say, if you don't do this, I'll hit you. We shouldn't use this kind of coercion or even using rewards and bribes. This isn't a correct way to force children to or trick them into believing what we want. Instead, sit down and talk with the child and say, well, if, if we do this, what happens? Or if we do this, what happens? And then, well, which, which do you want? Which is correct? Which is proper? Investigate things in this way. And then the child will be able to select for itself what what is proper instead of just relying on fear or greed. And we can use this even with, with children if we ourselves have the wisdom to do so. Unfortunately, in, in Thailand, as well as most other places, the religious conservatives are always saying, no, you, you can't do that. You have to trick them or convince them or bribe them or something to believe. But that isn't at all Buddhism, to be afraid that people won't, won't have the wisdom intelligence to select for themselves and choose, choose correctly. In Buddhism, everyone, even, not only adults, but children, must hold to freedom, must be independent in what they listen to, independent in how they think about things and independent in the, how they act in behave. Not a kind of selfish independence, blindly doing what one, one wants to do. That doesn't, go, that doesn't follow the advice of just, of not following one's own opinions or one's own common sense or ideas, but to investigate carefully and to have the freedom to think things through and try them out and then believe based on that personal experience. This is the freedom that Buddhism holds as fundamental, that always must be there in our study, practice, and realization. As far as what Buddhism is about, we've only had a chance to speak about half of what we figured to talk about, but time has run out, so we'll save the rest for another time. So we ask to close today's meeting at this time. And thank you for being good, good listeners. Maybe if it doesn't rain, we'll see you again tomorrow.